The NFL showed once again on Sunday why it will always and forever be the no fun league. But as an old grumpy man in New England once told us, we're on the Cincinnati. You are Locked On Panthers, your daily Carolina Panthers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of the Locked On Panthers podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, as always, Julian Council, talking Carolina Panthers with you every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, your team every day. That's our motto here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Make sure to watch our show and subscribe to our show over on our Locked On Panthers YouTube channel. If you ever miss any of our live shows on YouTube, like we do following the games on Sunday or anytime there's breaking news or just missing a YouTube episode, period. That's okay. You can always check out the podcast wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Just be sure to rate, review, and subscribe so you don't miss a single episode of the show. And be sure to follow me, Julian Council, on Twitter, at Julian Council, where every single Friday I answer your weekly Friday mailbag questions here on the show to participate in this week's edition of the Weekly Friday Mailbag. Either at me or DM me on Twitter at Julian Council. Today's episode of Locked On Panthers is presented by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their Prize Picks projection, you can win up to ten times your money on your entry. First-time users can receive a one hundred percent instant deposit match up to one hundred dollars with promo code Locked On. That's PrizePicks.com promo code Locked On. First off, before I get to what Steve Wilkes had to say to the local media on Monday following the Carolina Panthers 37-34 overtime thriller loss at Atlanta on Sunday, want to apologize to all the folks that watch the show on YouTube. And also thank you to so many of you out there who have done that and supported the show. I think we have 3,700 subscribers since starting to do that in late February. So really support appreciate everyone's support in watching the show and supporting the show that way and everyone who listens to the show as well. But on Sunday... As I've said, I like to now go live. I didn't want to do it earlier in the year as I was kind of navigating all the stuff I got to put on while doing it live as far as the YouTube production and having to put up the overlays that we have that shows our sponsors who also thank you to our sponsors for supporting the show. It was just a lot. So I was recording the show to start off on Sundays, but that takes way too long to finally get it up there, we'll upload it to YouTube. So the quickest way for me to get the shows up the last couple of weeks has just been by going live so you can have that as soon as possible following the game. Was working on Sunday, day job with MRN, the Motor Racing Network at NASCAR. Had to work the X-Men 8500 at Martinsville. I was in studio working it. Did you see the finish? Ross Chastain doing the video game move on the wall to get into the championship for this upcoming Sunday on, on, in Phoenix. That was awesome, but I was busy working that. Couldn't go live immediately after the game. So I was still at the station, at the studio, and wanted to do the podcast as soon as possible right then and there. I had done it before. Didn't have any audio or visual issues at that point in time as far as connection goes. But with YouTube, anytime you go live, anytime I record with internet connection, that can always be something that happens. It's happened in the past. Has not been much of an issue throughout the season since we moved over to a different streaming platform. But it was an issue on Sunday, and I recognize that. So I apologize to all the folks out there who tried to watch the show and just couldn't put up with all the, the cracking and the breaking down and all the messed up stuff that happened audio-wise and visually with that podcast episode on YouTube on Sunday. But that's why I also tell you, always check out the episode over on wherever you listen to a podcast because you can find it there on the podcast stream where the audio should always be pretty clear. I use a separate uh, recording uh, app to do that. So there should be no issues there. So with Sunday's episode, if you want to go back and listen to it, go back, listen to it on the podcast stream. Again, apologize to all the YouTube people out there. Now I've apologized. Um, Eddie Pinheiro in a way apologized to all of you for his missed kicks there in the game on Sunday afternoon, the Panthers 37 to 34 uh, loss in OT to the hated division rival Atlanta Falcons, who are now in first place and the Carolina Panthers are now in last place in the AMC South and also hold the number two overall pick. If the season was to, unfortunately in right now now i'm sure some of you would actually kind of like that because it means the carolina panthers could have their pick of pretty much any quarterback that they wanted in the draft now detroit who knows what they're going to do because they currently of course shocker hold the number one pick in the draft do they hang on to jared goff or they go out there and get one of these young quarterbacks we'll see how that plays out but the panthers still have nine games left to go and it's important to recognize that this team is certainly not tanking at least the guys on the field and the coaches as steve Wilkes showed us and we saw on Sunday, in the last two weeks, those guys are playing their tails off for this man. And 
I want to have a discussion at some point if they continue to play this hard. Now, they got to win some games. At what point does it become very clear that, hey, Steve Wilkes, this dude's a leader of men. He's also a Charlotte guy, so the sentimental favorite and factor there. He might be the head coach here. And finding that leader is way more important than being like, hey, let's go get the hot, trendy, young offensive coordinator who might not be as great of a leader and gain the respect that Steve Wilkes has so far gained through three weeks as the interim head coach here in Carolina. Now, the record's one and two, and that's not good enough. It's got to have close to a 500 record or, of course, a winning record the rest of the way to have any shot at getting this job. And I don't know if David Tepper will give him an actual shot at getting the job because, again, he said he has to do an incredible job even to be considered. Now, Eddie Pinheiro is going to need to do an incredible job the rest of the way to maintain his job as a kicker here in Carolina. And Steve Wilkes, let it be known on Sunday that one guy did not lose this football game. We always want to point the finger, play the blame game after a loss, especially a pretty tough loss on Sunday. Like for me, I'm overall encouraged just by the way that these guys have fought the last two weeks and especially on Sunday and the offense was something I could watch without my eyes bleeding. So I wasn't all that broken up about it. Also, having watched Carolina Panthers since their inception, like that's such a Carolina Panthers loss to shoot yourself in the foot constantly. It's not just the Pinero missed field goals at with a 33-yarder, the extra point that backed up to a 48-yarder, DJ Moore's penalty, which we'll get into here momentarily, whether that was a penalty or not. And by the way, DJ wasn't the only guy with his helmet off um, and still no fun league. So lame. Um, but it wasn't just that. It's the pick six. And Steve Wilkes went out of his way to say that wasn't all on PJ. You're going to blame PJ because he's the quarterback, but also was on the tackle there, which I believe would have been Icky Aquino since on the left side, not being able to push back his man. And also on the running back in that situation, Deontay Foreman not getting out wide enough to be able to receive that football. So it wasn't on just PJ, but it was on two other guys. As we've had to know, and that's why a lot of times coaches say I need to watch the tape because they don't want to place blame on one single player until they really see on film in the All-22 how things broke down. So there's that. There is the the sack that they gave up with Spencer Brown, who should not have even been on the field at that point in time on a critical third down late in the game. Him giving up that sack in that situation. DJ Moore's drop on fourth and 19. The defense not being able to tackle Demir Bird. So many things throughout the game. That led to the Carolina Panthers loss, aside from what happened with Eddie Pinera missing that 48-yard extra point and a 33-yard field goal in overtime. And make no mistake, by it. Kickers, they have to be able to make it within 50 yards on a routine basis in the NFL. I understand the NFL backed it up to 33 yards now for the extra point because they didn't want it just to be a gimme. And that certainly has led to much drama, as we've seen, especially in a situation where it goes from 33 to 48 with a penalty that was thrown out there with unsportsmanlike for DJ Morris or removing his helmet on Sunday afternoon. So it's added to more entry, but it's also added to kickers having to have even smaller of a margin for error moving forward. But within 50 yards, that's going to be routine. And I said to y'all, when Zane Gonzalez got hurt, that at some point in time, the kicker was likely going to cost Carolina Panthers a game, maybe two. Well, Sunday, that was one of those games. Is it all on Eddie? Of course not. But a large portion when you really needed him to do it, was on Eddie Pinheiro for not getting it done. Now, you would wonder, did the Panthers bring in another kicker? Steve Wilkes said there's no plans to bring in another kicker, that Eddie Pinheiro has been a really big part of what they've been doing up until that point on Sunday. And moving forward, he's still a big part. And let's also consider, guys, who out there is going to do a better job when Eddie Pinheiro has done so far here in Carolina. Up until Sunday, he had missed only one kick all season long. You do question how much faith that Steve Wilkes has in him and Chris Tabor who actually the special teams coordinator worked with Eddie Pinheiro back in Chicago and is a big reason why he's even here in Carolina in the first place, having him considering he had missed a 50. Well, he had made a 54 yarder earlier in the year. We've seen the last two weeks prior to Sunday, Wilkes not wanting to kick any long distant field goals with Eddie Pinheiro, who really has not been great from 40 plus in the NFL, which is why he was available anyway for the Carolina Panthers to pick him up. And I was reading Peter King's Football Morning America um, on NBCSports.com on Monday morning and Arthur Smith, the head coach there in Atlanta, when he was weighing the decision whether to back him up to put on the ensuing kickoff. He looked at the numbers and was told that, hey, Pinheiro, not great outside of 40. Go ahead and back him up. And as we saw, that worked out for him. I also feel like that's a no-brainer decision to back him up there on a 48-yarder opposed to, you know, having the kickoff. I don't know, but whatever. So Pinheiro staying here in Carolina, not really great options. He's been good up until Sunday. Let's hope he continues to be like he was prior to Sunday. If he's not, did absolutely have to go out there and find another kicker. PJ Walker wasn't great in the first half, got comfortable, lit it up in the second half. The XFL Mahomes, the 
awesome touchdown throw to DJ Moore to tie the game. And I wish it would have been the winner as well. He will maintain the starting quarterback job heading into Cincinnati this Sunday afternoon. Baker Mayfield will now be the backup. Steve Wilkes went out of his way to mention that Baker has been a great teammate. He's been a professional. And I did see a report that when Chris McCaffrey was traded, Baker Mayfield went to the general manager, Scott Fitter, and asked, like, hey, man, like, are we still trying to win games? And Scott said, yeah, we're still trying to win. So Baker is all in on the team. And we'll see if he gets another opportunity at this point in time. But right now, like I think it should be, it's the P.J. Walker show, considering how P.J.'s played the past two weeks, especially in the second half on Sunday and how he played last week in the 21-3 beat down to Tom Brady and the Bucks. Still waiting on word with Sam Darnold, who two weeks ago was assigned to come off of IR. That's 21 days to do that before he has to be placed on season-ending IR. So at some point in time, maybe this week, it will happen when Darnold comes back. What happens there? I think it's very clear that Baker Mayfield will not step out on the field again to be the Panthers quarterback if P.J. Walker and Sam Darnold are both healthy and active. Now, in the event one of those guys goes down, then obviously Baker Mayfield will go out there and play. But I do not think that's Sam, that um, Scott Fitterer wants to play him or even David Tepper or really Steve Wilkes wants to play Baker Mayfield considering how he played in the first five weeks of the season. And I personally don't need to see Baker Mayfield. I personally don't need to see Sam Darnold. I would rather just see P.J. Walker go out there and play. And Steve Wilkes didn't want to get into hypotheticals, but here on Locked on Panthers, we're going to talk about hypotheticals. Hypothetically, if all three are healthy, all three will be active because with the dead money, it does not help the Carolina Panthers to get rid of either one of the players. The trade deadline is going to pass by 4 p.m. on Tuesday anyway. So it's not like you can trade either one of those players if it is even possible before to trade them based off of just how poor their performance has been and the fact that they're now backing up P.J. Walker. So in the event that all three are healthy, Baker's probably the third string guy. Sam's the backup. And then P.J. Walker is the starter and should be the starter moving forward for the Carolina Panthers, especially considering how he's played over the past two weeks and that he's put the team in a position to win, which Sam didn't really do very well last year, of course, and that Baker Mayfield did a terrible job of doing when he was a starting quarterback earlier on this season. Saw a report from Ian Rappaport on Monday that the Panthers were working out former Miami, University of Miami, the U, running back Cameron Harris um, to be working out as a running back. Chuba Hubbard was out last week. Steve Wilkes said that he could have played or come back in the game against the Bucs. They want to give him a week off here on Sunday with the Atlanta Falcons. So I expect he'll be back this week against Cincinnati. When I saw that report, it made me think that maybe, maybe Chuba wasn't ready to go. I don't know. Maybe they were upset about how Spencer Brown performed. Not quite sure. Just looking at more depth at that position. So Cameron Harris got to work out, but it seems like Chuba Hubbard should be back later on this week. But one of the big storylines, aside from Eddie Pinheiro and aside from P.J. Walker, looking like he's the guy now moving forward for Steve Wilkes and the Carolina Panthers coming out of Sunday, was a DJ Moore penalty. And I've seen Tony Dungy tweet about it, Terry McCauley, who is the rules official for NBC Sports, and also saw Mike Florio, Pro Football Talk. There's been much discussion about whether it should have been a penalty, whether by rule it should be a penalty, or by just the spirit of things. Should the NFL be penalizing guys for having natural human emotion? We'll get into it. Because DJ Moore, yeah, not a great situation there. Bad timing. But was it a penalty? We'll talk about that here in just a moment on Locked on Panthers. But before we do that, let's go ahead and talk about some of our friends over at Prize Picks, which is our official fantasy sports partner here at Locked on Podcast Network. So how does it work? Pick the two five players. If they go score or more or less than their prize picks projection, you, you can win up to 10 times your money on any entry. No competing against other people. It's just you versus the projections available. Prize Picks offers projections on any sport that you watch. This includes the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, NHL, PGA Tour, college football, men's and women's college basketball, soccer, esports, NASCAR, cricket, and so much more. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. Safe and fast withdrawals currently operational in over 30 states and north of us in Canada. Download the Prize Picks app or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code locked on. If you deposit $100, Prize Picks will give you $100. If you deposit $50, Prize Picks will give you $50. Don't forget to enter promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match of up to $100 when you download the Prize Picks app or go to Prize Picks. Dot com today. On Sunday, the NFL proved why it will always be the no fun league as DJ Moore was penalized for a 
unsportsmanlike conduct penalty following the was it a 67 yard touchdown reception from PJ Walker that put the Carolina Panthers well tied the Carolina Panthers with the Atlanta Falcons Sunday afternoon in their 37 34 overtime loss and with that penalty the Panthers by rule got assessed a 15 yard penalty Arthur Smith the head coach with the Atlanta Falcons decided to not enforce it on the kickup but to enforce it on the extra point which moved the extra point back from a 33 yard attempt to a 48 yard attempt and we all know what happened Pinheiro shanks it well I guess kind of pushed it to the left didn't really shank it and it goes on misses again in overtime Panthers lose as young way Koo makes a 41 yard field goal and we see the importance once again of having a good kicker but we're not discussing kickers right now we're discussing whether it was a penalty and whether it really should be a penalty. And I'm not someone who wants to sit here and, and question officials and blame the officials. As I've gone over, the Panthers didn't lose that game just because DJ Moore got penalized and just because Eddie Pinheiro missed not one but two kicks, but it's also the defense not being able to get off the field when they really needed to late in that game and letting Demir Bird, of all people, run right by them. It's also the pick six right before the half, whether it's PJ's fault or Deontay Foreman's fault or Icky's fault. Plenty of mistakes that led to the Carolina Panthers' loss on Sunday, as Steve Wilk said, not one guy let help. It's not one guy that led to the loss on, on of the football game. There's plenty of other people who made mistakes on Sunday afternoon in that loss to the Atlanta Falcons. But looking at it, Pro Football Talk with Mike Florio kind of did a little report right up. He had talked to a source about what went on and whether this should have been a penalty. Because I've seen Tony Dungy, who, of course, is a former head coach um, in Tampa Bay and Indianapolis, a Pro Football Hall of Famer, who I tweeted out on Sunday night saying that it should not have been a penalty and speaking to Terry McCauley, who's the rules analyst for NBC, that DJ Moore was outside the field of play. So not being on, on the field of play means that if you take your helmet off, that should be fair game. But uh, unfortunately, the officials did not see it. So looking at it, on sports and like penalties, there are certainly – there's different interpretations. One of them is removal of a helmet by a player in the field of play or in the end zone during a celebration or demonstration or during a confrontation with a game official or any other player. That is a no-no. That results into a 15-yard penalty. And if it's your second one, you get tossed from the game. Now, here's the thing. DJ Moore, by rule, wasn't in the field of play. So he wasn't in the field of play or in the end zone within the language of the rule from what we saw. And if you saw it, he had stepped outside the white mark of the end zone and was no longer on the field of play or in the end zone. But apparently the rule is intended to prevent a player from taking his helmet off, throwing it and running around with that as a part of a demonstration in any portion of the field of play, whether it's within the boundaries of the gridiron or beyond it. So based off of that, it makes the rule sound like it was properly applied, although by the letter of the law, he was not on the field of play or in the end zone, but the interpretation, he still was not within the boundaries of what they want to happen on Sundays. And oh my God, someone just think of the children. How dare they see DJ Moore take off his helmet and celebrate? How could that possibly happen? And people could sit here and enjoy football while watching players celebrate in an emotional moment the biggest moment of dj moore's career which is sad to say but let's be honest he has never had a bigger catch than the get the catch he had on sunday from pj walker and pj walker may never have a bigger probably will never have a bigger throw in his entire life than the one that he had to tie the game on sunday in atlanta and that gets penalized now dj was not the only one by the way he took his helmet off also stefan sullivan Took his helmet off in celebration. Probably also seeing that DJ Moore had done it. He's like, hell yeah, dude, let's celebrate. Which I get it. It's human emotion. And that's a part of the no fun league that frustrates a lot of people to no end. Charles McDonald, who is a writer for Yahoo Sports, is a Atlanta Falcons fan. A tortured Atlanta Falcons fan, if you ever follow him on Twitter, at 4 Really funny guy. Great, great follow. Loves the Falcons. Also, of course, hates the Falcons, as any Falcons fan would when their team blew a 28-3 lead in the Super Bowl. How could you ever reasonably feel anything positive towards that, fan that franchise and organization? As, of course, here in Charlotte, on this side of 85, we laugh at them for that misfortune. But he wrote about it on a Monday how it's ridiculous that the NFL wants to penalize players for celebrating. And yes, I agree with Steve Wilkes that... They can't put themselves in a situation to even make it a judgment call, whether by the letter of the law, it should have been a penalty, or by the spirit of the rule, it should have been a penalty. It does not matter. 
you get put yourself in that situation. I totally understand where he's coming from, and I don't disagree with him. Yes, I kind of agree with it. And the whole th th thought of from Jonathan Vilma was like, hey, act like he's been there before. He hasn't been there before because his team sucks. His team sucks every year. He's stuck with terrible quarterbacks who could never make that throw. So, of course, the emotions after dropping a fourth and 19 that he should have caught – and in coming back, getting a second opportunity and making the most incredible catch of his career, yeah, DJ Moore is going to show that natural human emotion, which is why we even tune in every Sunday, man. That's why we watch. That's why we watch. For the moments like that and to see the raw emotions, the human spirit at work, at play. But instead, it's like 15-yard penalty. Let's back it up. Kicker misses. Panthers 2-6 and six instead of being 3-5. and five and having first place in the NFC South. Like, that's, it sucks. It was right. It seems like it was the right call just by the spirit of the rule, but letter it wasn't. So I don't know. We can go back and forth about it. I don't want to sit here and act like it's just the officials fall while they lost Carolina Panthers game. The game, the Panthers lost that game. DJ Moore can't put himself in that situation. Stephon Sullivan as well. But damn, dude, like, come on. Really? Really? That's what you want to do at that point in time? You want to, penalize guys for making great plays for battling their ass off for 60 minutes or i guess for 58 minute or 59 minutes and um what 48 seconds that point in time like that's what you want to do like it stinks i hate it i wish it didn't happen and that's really right there the margins we talk about the margins of winning and losing are so close where he zane gonzalez or eddie pinero rather don't want to put this on zane just misses those field goals just pushes it left DJ Moore keeps his helmet on or the, the official decides to use discretion and not penalize him. And someone showed me later on that uh, Terry McLaurin, who returned home to Indy, had to, what a huge catch to help the, uh, what are they called now, the Commandos? The Commandos went on Sunday that he took off his helmet on the field of play in celebration, no flag. I don't know. I didn't really see the context, but I just saw the, I just saw a still photo or whatever, a video of it. I, I don't know what's going on. But um, yeah, that sucks that the Panthers, of course, get penalized when potentially someone else playing for another team in another city does the exact same thing and does not get penalized at all. But, uh, you know, that's just, uh, I guess how the cookie crumbles. <laughs> it sucks dude. but, uh, yep, there we are. Well, TJ Moore, he's a Carolina Panther still. Hopefully he'll be a Carolina Panther come 4 1 PM on Tuesday afternoon, but the Panthers still have an opportunity to either deal for someone or deal someone away to another team as they did Last week, trading away Christian McCaffrey and Robbie Anderson. Should they make another move? And is Steve Wilkes worried that they will make another move and potentially hinder his ability to help the Panthers win games moving forward? We'll talk about that here in just a moment on Locked on Panthers. Locked on Panthers, of course, is sponsored by our friends over at betonline.net. It's the number one source for betting for this football season and, of course, basketball season as the NBA is already underway and college basketball is right around the corner. Find all the latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in-depth analysis on every game. And as always, Battle Online remains your continued source for all your sports wagering information with live betting and up-to-the-minute scores for every sport out there. It's the fastest and the easiest way to check in on all your favorite games and events, including Major League Baseball, MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about online where the game starts. When David Tepper decided to finally and mercifully fire Matt Rule a couple of weeks ago. We wondered at that point in time, is it fire sale time here in Carolina? Are the Panthers going to tank and try to get that quarterback to turn this franchise around? Well, as we've seen, hasn't really been much of a fire sale as they traded away Robbie Anderson to the Arizona Cardinals. Goodbye. See you later. Did you, did you guys notice on Sunday how Terrace Marshall had his best game as a Panther? Four receptions, 87 yards last two weeks. Aside from that one drop to begin that game against the Buccaneers, been pretty good. And why? I was bullish on Terrace Marshall coming this year, being the number two wide receiver. Well, Robbie gone, that certainly is the case. So moving on from Robbie Anderson, getting a fifth-round pick and a sixth-round pick later on, that's great to see that. Right? Was it six or seven? Whatever it was. Getting late picks to get rid of him, that was great considering that he was a rule guy and he was doing nothing to improve this team and really didn't need to be in this locker room or in the city anymore. So best of luck to Robbie in Arizona. Have no idea how that's going. You know, the Cardinals lost on Sunday, and uh, people are calling for Cliff Kingsbury's job. Although, didn't he just send an extension? <laughs> Sucks to suck. Um, but, but that's gone. Christian McCaffrey, big game on Sunday. He threw for a touchdown. He caught a touchdown, and he ran for a touchdown. 
because of course that's what CMC does. It's like people magically think all of a sudden like he's good again. Like, no, the dude's just healthy. He's an awesome player. But the Carolina Panthers showed on Sunday with Deontay Foreman that they didn't necessarily need to have Christian McCaffrey on this roster to help them win football games. And as I pointed out to you all in the past, Christian McCaffrey has not necessarily been what's want bro- like you know made or break the Carolina Panthers. Like they have lost with him, they've won with him. Whether he had a big game or a, or a not a great game hasn't really mattered because quarterback play has been so bad. When you have quarterback play like they got in the second half out of PJ Walker, then you have a chance to win games. So I, Deontay Foreman was great. He's shown that you don't have to pay a ton of money to guys like Christian McCaffrey. McCaffrey though, still an awesome player, a better player than Deontay Foreman. But Foreman really working out for what they want to do right now and being a downhill rushing attack and excited that he's here in Carolina and is getting his opportunity to be the lead back here moving forward, even when Chuba Hubbard returns, which I imagine will be the case, that he'll be the lead guy. And I think 2025 20, carries per game. I'm totally for it with De- Deontay Foreman, who's a monster. Like You got to get sick and tired of trying to hit a guy like that, which is why Steve Wilkes compared him to Derrick Henry and why John Robinson, the general manager in Tennessee, went out there and signed him last year when Derrick Henry went down with that foot injury. So those are the two moves. Christian McCaffrey's a 49er. Robbie Anderson is Arizona Cardinal. We've seen reports that teams have called about DJ Moore. They've called about Brian Burns. They've called about Derrick Brown. Reportedly, the Panthers turned down two first-round picks for Brian Burns. I don't hate that. He's an edge rusher. That is a position of value, and you don't want to give up a player and hope that you draft the right guy, after, or maybe two right guys, to replace him. I'm totally fine with Brian Burns, but they do need to get another edge rusher. Wouldn't make a lot of sense to get rid of one edge rusher and then have no edge rushers at all, especially when the Carolina Panthers struggle to get pressure on Marcus Mariota on Sunday in that loss to the Falcons. So he's a foundational piece. Same thing with Brian Burns. DJ Moore is the case as well. J.C. Horn, who's been excellent when he's been on the field. Same case. Um, Jeremy Chin, who's now eligible to come off of IR. Not, I mean, right now, of course, he's on IR, so he can't be traded. Like, those are the guys that they want to build this team around, especially defensively around moving forward. So none of them should go. And DJ Moore, if you're going to bring in a new quarterback, that's what happens. You got to give your rookie somebody. Justin Fields, he's getting better week in and week out. But he has no one to throw the football to up there in Chicago. You got to give your quarterback a guy. Look at Jalen Hurts in Philadelphia. He gets A.J. Brown. A.J. Brown has three touchdowns on Sunday. Dude's a stud. If you give your quarterback a stud, you have a chance to have a player who can really step up and be really good. We see that in Philadelphia this year. When Josh Allen got Stephon Diggs and Cole Beasley, both those guys were all pros that season for the Bills. That's awesome. That's what you want. Put weapons around your quarterback. So whether it's P.J. in the future, which I don't know. We'll see how that happens. Or More likely a rookie quarterback. You want them to have weapons around them. You already got rid of Christian McCaffrey. You have a good running game right now. We don't know what the future holds for Foreman here. We'd love to see him back if that's what the new coaching staff wants to do. If there is a new coaching staff where Wilkes is retained. But at the end of the day, you got to have guys for your quarterback to throw to. And we're seeing with Terrace Marshall right now after the last two weeks and with DJ Moore that those guys are somebody that you really want your young quarterback. If you bring in a young quarterback, which I think, again, is going to happen, you want those guys to be out there to help him grow and develop. So do not trade DJ Moore. Shaq Thompson is another name that we've heard about. Do you want to get rid of him? You would save a ton of money against salary cap next year by making that trade. Of course, they'd have to eat whatever dead money the rest of this year, but it should take about $12 million off the books next season where they decide to trade him now or they cut him or you're trade him in the off season. I don't necessarily want to do that. I think Steve Wilkes also probably doesn't want that to happen, but as he's mentioned, like that's up to David Tepper. That's up to Peter and that he's not trying to make this about him. I mean, we all want to talk about how he's a Charlotte guy and how if he wins enough games, he can get an opportunity to be the head coach. And I've loved how the team has performed the last two weeks under him. And it seems like he really has been a great leader and galvanized that group in that locker room. But Wilkes not concerned about that. He's going out there and he's just trying to, to get these guys to execute and to not make the mistakes that they made on Sunday that cost them that game. And I totally understand that. For Wilkes' sake, though, I really don't know if they make – I hope they don't make any other changes. I don't know necessarily what they would need to do. Like offensive line's great. You, your quarterback situation is what it is. I think they're fine at receiver. Don't need to do anything else at receiver at this point in time. I don't think they're going to make a move at tight end. I mean, yeah, I, I just think right now the roster, how it is, is just kind of what the Panthers need to move forward with. If they get a great deal, then I'm sure Scott Fitter will make the trade. But if anybody's going to be out of Carolina, I would imagine it'd probably be Shaq Thompson. But the rest of those guys we talked about, especially the young guys that they've said are foundational pieces and They've already rejected two first-round picks for. 
I can't see how come 401 on Tuesday afternoon that those two, that those not two, but the multitude of those players are still not Carolina Panthers here moving forward. So we'll see how it plays out. Would not be shocked because Scott Fitter told us and on every deal, but I certainly would be disappointed depending upon who that player is leaving town and the team still being in the thick of things in the NFC South moving forward through the last nine games of the season. That's going to wrap up this edition of Locked On Panthers podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Again, hosted by yours truly, Julian Council. Y'all make sure to watch the show and subscribe to the show over on our Locked On Panthers YouTube channel. You can also check us out wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Just be sure to rate, review, and subscribe so you don't miss a single episode of the show. And be sure to follow me, Julian Council, on Twitter at Julian Council, where every single Friday I answer weekly Friday mailbag questions here on the show to participate in this week's edition of the weekly Friday mailbag either at me or DM me on Twitter at Julian Council. In the meantime, be safe, be happy, be whole as always. Keep pounding, and I'll talk to you all on Wednesday.